do we have running right now? Reading groups. We one of our 13, but right now we have 10 because one of our already ended. One of our 10 currently running reading groups from Save Ancient Studies in America. Um, you can go to, what is it, saveancientstudies.org to check that out. Um, right now, we are just doing reading groups of primary text, and this week is some secondary uh, text about archaeology. Um, most of us leading the groups are recent PhD uh, earners, have just recently earned their PhD, or are PhD candidates right now at various universities across, mainly across the U.S., um, and this particular group is on ancient games. And this week, we are talking about the Mesoamerican ball game. I will say, since I uh, normally do ancient Near Eastern things, please forgive me if I say Mesopotamian ball game and correct me because that is not what I'm talking about this week. I kept reading it as Mesopotamian yeah. <laughs> like not. so many times. I can't not. So I have a, as I normally do when we switch, um, topics. I have a little PowerPoint, which hopefully it won't crash like it did last Wednesday in the creation group. Are we good? Can everyone see? Yep. Okay. This is the quick little PowerPoint intro to um, what I call the Mesoamerican ball game. A lot of people refer to more uh, specifically as the Mayan ball game. Forgive me for the terrible PowerPoint because this is like from a, something I did like three years ago that I just pieced together this morning. Um, but usual as usual, um, just a brief intro to where and what we are actually studying, uh, specifically here, Mayan civilization, um, like Egypt, which we've also talked about in this group, known for large scale architecture. Um, we also have nice, pretty paintings, which we are actually conveniently talking about tomorrow because we're talking about the Mayan creation story in the creation class. Uh, and then we have just to situate us on the map, the map of the Mayan world, which I believe there's another map in a second. Um, creation you, stories tomorrow at 10 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. <laughs> it was at 10 a.m., yes. Uh, so we have lots of archaeological evidence of the Mayan ball game from big sites that probably a lot of people stop at on their cruises and such. Um, I know when I've seen them before, it has been on these, you know, quick little jaunts places that are organized by other groups. When I was younger, trip the kind of trips that I hate taking now, I don't like being organized like that. But when you're with your parents and such, you, you do what they say. Um, but we have this normal style here, which you see of these slanted sides. And then these little things up here look like this over here, these round little holes. So archeologically, this is the big scale stuff, the large scale architecture that we're working with. But we also have small scale depictions and um, iconographic depictions. So here, um, this is the, the Mayan name for the game, Pocatoke. Oh, here we have an image actually of one of the balls. You can see this is not like a normal bouncing ball or tennis ball or something. This is made of a, you know, kind of rubber, but these are hard, big balls that you don't picture like bouncing or something of that sort. We also have iconographic depictions because the ball game plays into the, what I call the creation story, but it's more than just creation, the Popol Vuh. Um, which we will be talking about the ball game stuff related to that we will talk about next week in this group. Um, today we're mainly focusing on the archaeological evidence, but you can see depictions of the ball here of gods and these first twins, these people in the creation story playing the ball game uh, in these creation myths. We also have um, figurines. Uh, you see here the person holding the ball and over here you actually kind of get to see their uniforms, I guess, outfits, their costumes. Um, so they wear this very heavy type belt thing. And then- Jerseys. <laughs> yeah, jerseys. Yeah, let's go with that. And also here you can see maybe some sort of uh, shoulder protection, like shoulder pad type thing. And I actually have a few videos to show you. So maybe you can see why you would need to be wearing these kind of things. But 
tying into the the name of this reading group playing with death um, one of the common things that is attributed to this game is that in at least one form of the game the losers were sacrificed um, we can talk about one of the articles for today was about that but uh, these games may have in one form been kind of staged games where the winner and loser was predetermined with the, the winners being kind of local champions and the losers being um, maybe prisoners of war or something. So the whole time they're just enacting this elaborate ritual performance where the end outcome is already determined. We can skip that video because that was kind of silly, but I have a video of some people that maybe you know, including myself playing, trying to attempt to recreate this, which we do um, in a summer class that I teach, you can see we're playing with an actual bouncy ball um, and we tie hula hoops basically onto the trees. One of the very tricky things that you'll see my friend Federico, who is Italian, can never figure out when we play this, is that you're not supposed to use your feet and your hands. It's not supposed to devolve into soccer like it does sometimes. You're really only supposed to use your elbows and your hips to move the ball. And here's one from my actual class, which they were a little a little better than the the grad students were at playing this. So that is attempted recreations from people who don't know what they're doing. But before we talk about it, this is a game that is still played today. So I wanted to show just a quick video of that just so people Oh, if it connects, yeah, just so people can see how it is maybe supposed to be played. So they basically they're going to try to score. So that is my intro spiel. We can talk more about any of this. I have other videos. This was on an, an episode of that uh, History Channel show, Expedition Unknown as well, which I do have a clip of that. It just like happened to be on one night while I was watching. So I have a clip of that that I filmed on my phone. Hey, um, is that the one where they're talking about the ball being made with the skull? Because I just recently watched something where they're trying to debunk that and they like make their own version of it. And they're like, wow, this sucks. <laughs> yeah, so the depictions of that, particularly in the um, in the Popol Vuh, it, it seems that the ball was supposed to be or at least depicted as a skull. So yeah, but the evidence that we have, nothing is really that. Right. Well, I wish I remember what it was that I watched, but it was some episode of a show or something and they tried like making it themselves, you know, like with some plastic skull or something, obviously. And then like the kind of rubber that they would have used for these balls. And it basically ended up being like way bigger, first of all, obviously, um, and like way too heavy, not bouncy at all. Like the chances that they actually used it for this game. But then also like, to me, this game in general, like you said, they don't use their arms and legs. Basically you're supposed to like use your hips and whatever. And like, you're going up this slanty wall <laughs> and all this stuff. So it seems unplayable to me anyway. So I don't know. <laughs> yeah, it's really hard even with a ball that bounces. Exactly. So, yeah. So I, I made some other brief notes that we can use as jumping off topics or we can talk about whatever. Um, this kind of ties in with stuff we've talked about in other games in this group, which is there does seem to have been a betting aspect. Um, there seems to have probably been two versions of the game, one that was, you know, more local fun, like your local soccer teams just playing each other, and then one that was more ritualistic. Um, there's also evidence at some sites of two ball courts where most people think that one of them was to play on and the other one was reserved for the gods to play on. Um, there is some sort of connection likely to the underworld that we see that in the textual stuff that we'll look at next week, um, but also likely to fertility. This ties in with the ball course generally having the same geographic orientation, 
which ties into the way that the sun rises and dies every day. Um, David, you look like you have a question. This is like the, the ball game is the center of the universe. It's essentially, essentially the universe. Oh, wow. yeah. That's no, I would say the center of the universe. Like, center of the universe. All yeah. religion yeah. is symbolized in the ball game. Yeah, it seems that the two times that it definitely it definitely was played every year was on the equinoxes. Um, so there's some sort of fertility astronomical connection, but then there's the the very obvious violence connection as well. So that is that's my spiel. Jumping off stuff, I open the floor. Yeah, I don't know. I just just from what you were just saying, I guess the second or the second one that I read, I guess I don't know if it was the first or second reading to other people. Um, let me let me look really quick to see what I mean by the second one. <laughs> um, but the one that's talking more about these like spatial fields of things and stuff. Um, so Shane, you might know what I'm talking about. Yeah, that was the Kohadas one, I think. Yeah, yeah. Symbolism and ritual function from the American Indian Quarterly Journal or something. Yeah. Um, or at least that's what it's saying at the top of the page I'm looking at right now. <laughs> um, anyways, uh, yeah, that was really interesting. And kind of like I literally had to like reread some of the sentences five times because it was a lot of north, south, east, west. <laughs> Lauren doesn't understand what they're talking about. <laughs> um so yeah, that one, that, uh, just those kinds of aspects uh, or how it translated then to the art too, these kinds of three direction artistic displays and stuff. Um, I, I don't even know how to describe it because I was barely understanding it when I was reading it, to be honest. This one is like, <laughs> this is an article that I found the beginning and the end to be helpful and the middle to be extraordinarily technical. Um, very yeah, direct yeah very direct yeah 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 it started to get very technical and i was like oh my gosh i need like eight thousand more pictures to go along with this the good, the good thing about this article in my opinion is showing while and i i'm guilty of this too connecting it solely to the mayans this article is very clear um that this game existed as early as like the beginning parts of olmec civilization which recently, and I looked this morning and couldn't find the article again, like in the last three months, they found a ball game that they date to like 1500 BCE or ball court that they date to like 1500 BCE. So it's normally talked about in like the, from like the 10th to 15th or 16th century CE. It's been around, you know, it was around 2000 years before that, again, through multiple civilizations and, multi, you know, would various uh, mythologies and things of that sort. So we're talking about meaning that that changes over time perhaps as well too. But the, the institution of the ball game, whether it's the same rules or not, we don't know, but the ball game itself as something important exists in Mesoamerica for 2,500 years. Or um longer. 3,500 years. Yeah, because just from, I mean, I guess, like I said, I read the other article first. So reading that and knowing like nothing about this <laughs> and reading that one first and then this one second, it was like, oh, so this the first one for like forgot to mention these other civilizations that were around way before then that were doing these kinds of things too. And also the, the other one talks more about the Aztec connections to it too. So yeah. um and that's just more well known, I guess, right. you know, more recent too. So just, um, it was interesting to see those connections to things. I think it was that one that they also made connections to like this Hercules story and some more like classical things too. And that's what I study as you guys know. So it was easier to understand then versus like a lot of information of stuff that was brand new to me. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I think this is one of those, the Mayan and Aztec ones have captured the imagination of people, not only because they were bigger civilizations with more architecture, but also because we have text. So like we associate it with the Mayans because they talk about it in the Popol Vuh, which people know and we have versions of, but that's a late 
a late discussion of the ball game when you look at all of Mesoamerican history. I, I said Mesoamerican. I'm, I'm tracking my, every, every time I clap for myself in my head. You should. You should. <laughs> it seems like there are a lot of pictorial representations of it. There are. Yeah. Really those little, especially those little ball players that I showed, there are tons of those little figurines too. Like, it's one of those things that are almost as prevalent as like every university in the country having some cuneiform tablet. Like, if you have something from Mesoamerican civilization, odds are you it's have a little. It's a little dude with shoulder pads. Little dude with little dude holding a ball, or little dude with shoulder pads, <laughs> or something. Yeah. Wow. So, do they know what those were? They were just some kind of amulet, or like, or we have no idea. Total guesses. I d I don't know. There may be some theory. But I'm I'm unaware. Nobody I've talked to that studies. I don't. I granted don't know a ton of people that study this, um, but I have not heard a theory about what those are. Any chance we know fine spots? Like, are they in homes or are they on the near these ball courts? I think they're near the ball courts in the more administrative and and like religious location. Oh my gosh! I hope they're like action figures. Like this is my favorite player. <laughs> I hope he doesn't die next time. <laughs> yeah, that would suck. <laughs> I mean, there are there are plenty of plenty of things to discuss in relation to stuff we've talked about in the past. Like the the very glaring one is what's the kind of connection or what's the what are similarities between this and like gladiatorial stuff. Uh, that's less religious, but still spectacle with violence. Um, and, you know, something that I was interested in when we talked about those, where, what's the role of the spectators in these? Um, I think that's how, uh, well, again, for me, the first reading started out kind of more commenting on, like, whether you want to think that watching sports is the same as this or not it's kind of the same thing we just yeah. think we're better because we're less violent now in some ways but again if people like actually that's a really good connection to make with stuff now because there's a ton of controversy around american football and yeah. how because we're less violent right no right i mean but just i mean because literally at the end of the game we don't cut someone's head off <laughs> but like you know at the end of a football career you probably have quite a few brain injuries and other physical injuries yeah. so is there any sense that people were like players like professional they were, they were professional or mean like good players i think so named? yeah that's the sense that we have but it's unclear whether those were the people who would have been participating in the ritualistic version of those, or whether those are just the, maybe every city has their local team and they play each other. And that's just for fun, basically. So if the ritualistic version was more like some captured pe people sacrificial thing, was it, I mean, I guess, I don't know if we have any way of possibly knowing this, um, but like, was it something like, have you watched this show Spartacus? Um, so in the show, it's like he lives at like this like gladiator like house and they're like training them the whole time and whatever. So would it be something like these captured people would be trained? Cause otherwise how would they know how to play this game? Like literally at all, they must be easy. Like, are they thrown into enough. it not knowing, or are they trained and then they know at least a little bit? I think it's ubiquitous enough in, Meso in Mesoamerica that you assume that the people, like, the people you're conquering may have the same tradition and same mythology that you do. Right, right. Very interesting. Yeah. I like the idea that they don't know at all and they're just thrown into the game because they're they're a sacrifice anyway. So it's like, why even why teach them how to play? They're going to die either way. So you might as well, like, make it. <laughs> I mean, there's also the possibility that being sacrificed is a honor. Okay, that's another thing I was going to bring up um, about how they mention it with Aztec stuff, which I know this is a lot less focused on Aztec stuff, but I, I didn't know anything about how in Aztec sacrifices, they were like impersonators of the god and they were sacrificing a god that's like really interesting and like backwards from 90% of religions, <laughs> you know? So like, 
question mark what? Do you know more about this? I know what you just said. I think that may be okay. <laughs> that may be the extent of it was what was in that article pretty much. Okay. Oh, so it's okay. So is it something that has to only do with those specific gods that are also just like not happen to be, but are related to this ball game? It wasn't like a whole, like all of their pantheon is potentially sacrificed in different. Four different yeah, I think it's, different. it's reenacting what we're going to look at for next week in the, in the mytho mythological text that we have. Okay. 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 So more connected to like creation stories and stuff. Yeah very interesting just because as i said that's very it to have a god be sacrificed and then like it's an impersonator because then it does it may so have being the impersonator of this god and being sacrificed in theory to me then sounds like it's something that's like a high honor right how much does this connect to a uh, battle that you know the, the contest of in a game is to sort of be a, a recreation of battle just in a highly formalized type of way obviously there no, there's no ball battle but it's still a, a meeting of two different sides usually right i mean we've seen that before in the roman stuff at least i think one of the things one of the the board games we looked at is recreating battle or some sort of lesson teaching on how to engage in warfare and what you're supposed to do training um, I don't know if this is necessarily training, but it could easily reenact battle. It could be reenactments of battles like we see in gladiatorial contests. Um, right. Well, maybe that's why the gods are involved also, because right. usually you would assume that the gods have a role in battle and leading battle or in mm -hmm. the, or the, the, the personification of the armies in the battle potentially. Right. I mean, it could also be in the, this could all tie together in the same kind of stuff that most of us are more familiar with the, the classical and Near Eastern stuff where when you beat, when you conquer someone else, you're effectively saying my deity is better than yours as well. So when you when you beat them in the battle and kill them, you could literally be killing their deity. So that could be something like that as well. There are no intramurals, right? No. <laughs> this is one of those games that seems very difficult to train for. It was something I, I, something I read yesterday that was like, some Reddit post that was like, what's the best thing that you can never learn how to do? And it was like some Russian military move that you can't teach anyone to, like the easiest way to kill somebody, you can't teach anyone to do it because they kill them during the training. <laughs> <laughs> no, but literally that's what this game sounds like to me. It sounds impossible to play. Like yeah. you're like climbing up walls and having a ball that's not bouncy, that you're not supposed to use your feet or hand like just how do you even like <laughs> so there is the other ver there's another a second version of the game a few of these courts don't have the slanted sides and instead seem to have end zones like on american football fields where you're just trying to get the ball into the end zone which seems much easier much easier yeah and also just one of the readings kind of was referring to it as these like sand pit kind of games as if a kid could just like drop a board for it and play and I'm like no what kid is playing this <laughs> I mean I guess may it must have been at least common enough that it spread so far and whatever it must have not only been professional people playing otherwise it wouldn't have lasted so long and spread so far um but also I don't know I guess people might look at in 2000 years people might look at modern American football and be like what the <laughs> what were they doing yeah. uh, so yeah just it seems so impossible to me oh there was something else that i was going to say about how these ball courts were decorated um but now i totally lost my train of thought on it um i did write down a few other things that i was like oh that's really interesting the connection to hercules thing like i said obviously because that's what i actually know about um so that was really interesting but also my question from it was this thing about the twins so do you know anything about in real life were twins like super special and amazing like they would be like taken away after birth and like made some kind of ritualistic thing or something that's a question that i've had as well and do not know the answer to and haven't had time to go down that like that rap rap <laughs> I don't see this. Um, I have also wondered that. Um, I feel like they must have been if it was such an important like story like this. 
And it's something that's not super common and whatever. So it's already still, even in modern times, people are like, ooh, you're a twin or like what I, and just like has certain things to it. Like, do you guys have psychic abilities with each other? <laughs> like all of that kind of stuff. Like if they get cut, does your arm hurt? <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah. So I feel like that's something that is very cross-cultural things with twins, triplets, whatever going on from there. Um, but not all of them necessarily have it in like creation stories and stuff like that, but some do. So you would think like, I just think it would be unavoidable that in actual society, people that are twins having birth twins or whatever would be venerated in some way for that. I miss, I miss the twins thing. Where are the twins fit in? Okay, Shane, you should explain it because I won't explain it as well. Twins are in the textual evidence, which is posted for the creation story creation group tomorrow and already posted for this group for next week. Um, I, some, I like looking at the archaeological evidence first in a lot of cases because then they you, didn't talk of they like mentioned it slightly and my brain was like rabbit hole. What are these twins? <laughs> they're these twins that basically go down to the underworld at the beginning of time and play. They're like go, progressing through almost picture like going through the the different gates in the like Ishtar Demuzi story, right? Like in the descent, they're like going through the different gates, and at at least two of those gates or two of these areas they play the ball game against the gods it's amazing how similar this is to you should read the creation Damian. story it's basically the same that's so cool yeah yeah wow obviously another thing i was going to point out is like so crazy that these things are so like when is this creation so this is a mayan one specific yeah, so this right? is probably that's probably written down ish i don't know that version of the story is no more than a thousand years old but still predates European contact. Oh, yeah, well, yeah right. for sure. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But that's really cool that they have similar conceptions of the netherworld, obviously, right? Yeah. And what on earth a ball game has to do with the netherworld, which I still don't understand. In, in well, we have the, we have so, the ball game in the netherworld in Gilgamesh. Too. Yeah, I know. I'm saying I don't yeah. understand. What does the ball game have to do with the netherworld? I mean, like, right. obviously, the ball game and the netherworld go together. Yeah. Because it's like hell playing this game. <laughs> That's what I think. That's what it sounds like to me, at least. <laughs> well, at least in this ball game, if you have people dying at the end of it, then that's an automatic connection to the netherworld, but not yeah. really the one that's probably spun up. In it. I'm assuming in the in the story, in the creation story, it's probably not about the dead people from the ball game going to the netherworld. The no, ball they don't lose there. and then go down right, or they something. Don't go like lose. That. Yeah. They're like already there, or there is that what it is? Kind of, they're already there because they're playing against these like lords of the netherworld, right? So they're already there. The contest to get further, yeah, the they go to, go to go further basically because it's a circle. So going further yeah. means you'll get out, yeah. Okay, okay, it, <laughs> totally. yeah. Wow, very very detailed and interesting but i guess i mean right so then is it like is this ball game like one of the most important things like in in their like whatever creation story myth kind of thing because if it's how you get in and get out of the underworld which is also what the sun and moon do too and how you like eat then it's like literally one of the most important things is this game yeah and it seems to be like we've seen throughout this group that like not describing the rules to something is a way to to know that it's very common if you don't have to describe something then everybody knows what it is right. like we saw in senate or in gilgamesh or like it's just the ball game everybody knows what that means or like it's just you know we're playing senate that's i don't have to say anything more than that we're playing senate because everybody knows what what that means and how to do that very true, because this is what I'm confused about with the stairs too, because now, ow, now some of your like pictures that you just showed in your PowerPoint at the start made me more confused about how this ball court is set up, because what are the stairs? Like, why are there, one of the articles they were talking about for at least like two pages about the ball being rolled down the stairs. Yeah, so the way I always understood it is that the staircase is like on the temple and that's where the people are sacrificed. Like even in bad movies, you see the like 
decapitation things associated with Mesoamerica. And then it's the blood going down. You know, they cut the head off at the top of the stairs. Okay, like, actually, do you mind putting up your PowerPoint? And I'm going to tell you which picture I want you to explain to me. <laughs> the, the temples are are sort it's of. It's a more modern one pyramid. with like green grass all around it, um, of like the ruins. Right, they're step pyramids. Yeah. I mean, or they're all yeah. step everything. So yeah. I was picturing the stairs being either above the slanted thing, like directly above the slanted thing, but it's kind of behind it to the side. So it's like pointing the wrong way to me. There's some over here too. Yeah, it could be kickoff. Yeah. yeah or, but then, I mean, so it made more, that's, what made, that's what I thought. I was like, are they not dropping the ball from the top of these stairs? But then I thought the stairs would be on top of the slanted part. But there, are, I mean, I guess the ball can start from the side too. I don't know. They could, there could have been stairs here. We just don't know. Right? Yeah. And then yeah. they literally said this for like one second and maybe I missed it in other parts, but it was something about like in some depictions, there's like ladies sitting on these stairs or by these stairs. Yeah. I picture that as like the onlookers. Like, I think we talked, I feel like we talked about last week of like the people from the civil war who said like, oh, there's a battle going on today. Like, we're going to go take our picnic lunch and watch. Humans are so crazy. You guys, in the other groups, in John's group, apparently I always talk about serial killers and murdering people and they make fun of me. But I'm like, you guys, look at what humans do, though. They had picnics to watch the Civil War. Like, yeah. <laughs> like am I that crazy for talking about serial killers when that's what people used to do for fun? <laughs> Very interesting. Okay, you guys, what's what's the next? I think the, the motif of the bound captive is also interesting. It connects to what I was saying before that maybe this is really sort of a uh, stylized representation of battle. Yeah. Oh, actually, that too. Like with their outfits, how are they wearing these outfits and playing this impossible game? Like everything about it is impossible. <laughs> <laughs> Um, cause especially in the artistic depictions, they look extremely extravagant and hard to even just like wear, let alone play a game in and a hard game. I mean, there could be a, you know, uh, whatchamacallit, there could be like a pomp and circumstance That's why I'm part saying, of the game like super and then really they realistic. take that stuff off to actually play. It's like, you know, the warm ups. Yeah. Getting into it with, with the lights on them shining down, flashing and stuff. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I mean torches passing around or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> Running down the stairs past the blood. <laughs> so good. There's no blood yet. That's true. I mean, I don't know. Are they I mean, that's, maybe it's the second match? Right, true. Because some okay, so that's true too. So about this whole the most important games that are at the equinoxes or whatever, they were talking about multiple matches, and one of them, like I don't know, maybe they said this directly or not, um, that the sacrifice happened like in the last match of the round of matches. Oh. Is this true or not? I have no idea. Being like the, I don't know. I don't think there's like hard evidence for that. I think that's a theory. Right. Or maybe it happened every time. Maybe they like killed everyone on the team every time. That's another thing too. So in these depictions, it's very like one-on-one -on -one kind of things usually. Like it's representing this game, which has teams, though. Like it it's not. Like there, it seems like there was a prescribed captain of each team, so even the sacrifice could have been of one person. Yeah, like the leader of the losing team. Seems like a role you would not want to get voted into. No, yeah. it really doesn't. Taking one for the <laughs> team. Yeah. <laughs> the ultimate way but i guess depending on what you believe is this like an honor to be sacrificed for this reason right even if you are a captive if you are from somewhere near enough that has similar enough beliefs something that i always think about too is i mean we've talked about kind of how hard this game is to play part of me can picture this game taking like days yeah, I just, how, right, how does, like, the point system work for this? It's supposed, if you get it through, I think you, if you get it through the hoop in that version, you win. But, okay. like, with that ball and those hoops being off the, I mean, they're not only up the slope, they're off the, you know, off the top of it, too. You can That's just, what I was trying to say when we were watching the video you showed. 
how did they yeah. score? Like they were all just standing in the middle and like seeing the ball was moving back and forth between them or something, but nobody was really trying to go up the side. Yeah. So I'll tell you, let me show. I have the, the clip from my phone. Let me show it and see if that. This is what you do in your spare time. You watch people play um, Miss American sports. I mean, who doesn't? Obviously. <laughs> so here, let's see. Out on the street, there's no shortage of impromptu soccer matches. But locals here still honor a much older game with much snazzier uniforms. This is so cool. This is the Lion Ball game. Some version of this. Oh, that guy. <laughs> yeah. Has been played. He makes everything sound so interesting. I never knew that. Nobody's ever seen this before. Okay, so that's how we have to make like future Sasa YouTube videos. <laughs> Look, it's all fuzzy and like it's in a dream. So I'm more than a little concerned when I sub in. I understand it's kind of like basketball. Another game I'm not so good No, at. this is nothing like basketball. <laughs> it's a lie. <laughs> So at least these guys not in the big arena are, are really trying to score every time. Yeah. But here's what they showed like one clip of it that I think is it's kind of like basketball. Back here. You see the guys like here, right there. See him like roll across and hit it with his side and things like that. So you can picture them like rolling up the side and sliding and things like that. Um, Oh, that's just so crazy. Is, is there like, any way that we know about the the ways that you're allowed to hit the ball from the ancient text? Not from the text that I, not from anything that I know. No. Okay. Yeah. I think that it's one of the, really. like we luckily have continuity, enough continuity of that culture that people have still kept playing it and that's what we have. Yeah. What other games have gone on for so long? I mean I'm sure there must be some Chinese games. The one that I always say, and that's changed a lot, um, which I usually look at in, like the last day of this class if it's in person, um, to show how games change over time is Mancala, which has traveled the whole world. Everyone, to, everyone now even plays it differently, but it's still everywhere. That's so true. I had like so many random Moncala boards when I was a kid and just like made up my own games to play with it. Like, <laughs> you sit down. And so, like, when I give that game board to like the students and I'm like, play either like you either don't know how to play, so like come up with a way to play or play the way that you, you know, have always played. It's like two people sit down, they've both played Mancala their whole lives and they're both basically playing a different game. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I'm, I'm sure that it's like that. Um, wow, really interesting. Yeah, Mancala is so interesting because it is so flexible like that. You could do so many different things with it. Other games, it would be really hard to change up yeah. what you do with it. Uh, some some questions, Shane? Yeah. Yeah, it's very interesting. Yeah, I never know these things before. And uh, do we have us uh, many uh, places for this game or do we have only one place we have a, we have i don't want to say a, t a lot of courts but we have a, a good number of, of ball courts yeah ah, okay so yeah and then i have some hypothesis that it might be a very uh good role good imp good impact to to society to for entertain not only entertaining but also de-stress some stress, de-stress some tensions between groups, maybe? I think it's also like self-identity, right? Like you're rooting for your local team or local whatever. Yeah, yeah, right, right. Okay, okay. You can't watch on TV and root for anybody? No. That's oh, true. you only get your home team, that's it. Only get your team. Yeah. <laughs> it's interesting, okay. And it, it's also connected with Old legend, I think. Uh, maybe 
in the Chinese chess game, uh, it's based on the stories of two heroes uh, who fight historically, and then yeah, one guy died and another one win, and then and we have we don't have the uh, information about ancient legend and this game, right? We we cannot relate it. Yeah, we have the 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 stuff from the Popol Vu, which is doesn't help us recreate the game, but we know that it's around. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I put up I put up this morning. It's up for tomorrow's class, but it's also up for um, What struck me what Michael just said is that maybe then maybe that story is an etiology for the Chinese chess game. So maybe these stories are also sort of it's what implanting them in the mythological story is making it an, an etiology for uh, a cultural you know, something that's very visible in the culture of this game. Yeah, so basically this ball game's around and it's important why around it, the, yeah. Right, as long as anybody remembers. Yeah. And and it's very important to us. So <laughs> it just ends up working its way into the mythology. Yeah. I mean it becomes the same like we we kid, but like people say, you know, baseball is America's pastime or football is America's game. Like sports do become very connected with places. Mm. You guys, I think people in Wisconsin literally pray to pictures of Aaron Rodgers. So, <laughs> like, I'm not surprised, but I don't know why he's not that good anymore. I mean, we can Where's talk it? about that another time. You <laughs> seen a noticeable increase in people wearing masks since the governor of South Carolina said that he wouldn't let uh, college and high school football happen. If oh my God, that's oh. genius! I, I haven't heard about that. We have that's to wear our masks so idea. we can watch football. <laughs> oh my god that's such a good way to make people wear masks they should definitely do that in wisconsin yeah you'll, you'll always need some incentive with children to get them to do yeah. what you want them to do <laughs> it's that it seems i don't yeah. see the issue i like want to wear a mask i'm like y'all nasty oh, like, man, I, 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 I like they're like a fashion statement i got my atlanta braves mask i have my wake forest mask i wear them out. <laughs> exactly <laughs> who was it some some European woman president, like right away when this started, had like her outfits all matching her masks and stuff. And I was like, okay. <laughs> and it's, it is all over my Facebook. I'm constantly getting sponsored ads for masks and face shields and all of that stuff. It's totally a fashion statement now. Wow. And brands yeah. are capitalizing on it for sure. Brands we, should, we should tell Trump there's a presidential mask. It's like, it looks like a blue suit with a red tie down the middle. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm surprised, I'm surprised he hasn't like embraced it and put "Make America oh, Great." Forget it. Make America Great, exactly. great and he it's can more... write Trump on the bottom and start selling them. That's yeah. what I don't get. It's more <laughs> advertising. It's like free advertising constantly. Actually, that's really smart. I should make. We should make Sasa one. <laughs> Sasa mask. <laughs> Sasa. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, like our like <laughs> joining president or something. <laughs> Sasa mask because it's promoting. You know, like educate yourself about why you should wear a mask. <laughs> oh, I love it. Okay, oh, so then we can go after happens. some of that COVID, uh, you know, relief funding. Yeah, we need to make more SASA masks. Um, <laughs> maybe. Oh my god! Exactly. I'm pretty sure small businesses can get it, like up to ten thousand dollars or something. <laughs> That's where it's at. And and maybe I missed the information. How how do they make the bowl? What's the mm. material? Yeah, yeah. Okay. So, Michael, before you joined, we were like slightly mentioning this because I okay. happened to watch some documentary things. So don't worry, you don't you didn't miss too much because I was just talking about the random theory about how it's a skull inside of this rubber that they use. Oh, but okay. then we didn't actually get into it. But it was kind of like at least the thing I watched, they kind of like debunked that theory because the ball would end up being too big and like too heavy, mm -hmm. not bouncy yeah. like at all because this kind of rubber isn't that bouncy. Yeah, it's um, a heavy rubber material. So this is one of the balls. You can see it's, you know, oh, okay. mm. bigger than a bigger than a softball, but is smaller than ball? a ball. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's like fossilized rubber, basically. Wow. Okay. But still, but it obviously doesn't like have a skull in it. It would be bigger. <laughs> yeah. Than if it <laughs> what What if you use like a monkey skull or an infant skull? It could be a baby, that's for sure. It could definitely be a baby. Now we're going to child sacrifice, moving right along. Why not? They're more pure. They're more pure. <laughs> oh my god. Yep, yep. Maybe if it's it's the case, 
uh, it's, if it's a bone, maybe there will be a different story or ancient, some legend, maybe it's connected. It's my idea, but we don't know. Yeah. To the create, to the making of the ball? Yeah, maybe some stories or legends affect the material first, but later yeah. it, it might be changed to the lover or something else. Yeah, it could be. A, yeah, I could maybe. see that. Like the material maybe. being something special too. Well, a ball could represent an egg. Oh, I don't know. Okay. That's that's okay. just, just an absolute total guess. I okay. No idea. Many, many, many. Simple. Could represent I mean, the sun or the moon or something too. Oh, right. I was going to say, right. if it is part of the creation story, which is basically this rebirth of the sun and moon back mm. into the world. That's the cyclical cycle. And yeah. if there's a baby in the ball, you know, I don't know. And some of these mm. depictions, I mean, a bunch of these... baby rabbit hole. That wasn't just a joke. <laughs> yeah, no, but seriously, a bunch of these depictions have the have a head or even a whole person in the ball. So it's not like that far off, right? I mean, the one that I, it was the one with like a captured enemy with his like neck snapped backwards, but like. <laughs> that would be the opposite of birth. <laughs> yeah, but he's being reborn. Come on. <laughs> hmm. Does this have other cultural connections? I mean,. So the big three they get thrown out are the connection to the underworld, the connection to fertility, and the connection to sacrifice writ large, just as a an entity in Mesoamerican culture. Um, I meant to other sort of arenas of cultural endeavor. Like, I don't know, do people have little shrines to the, to the ball in their houses or? Oh, not that I know of. Does this have anything to do with like political stuff? It could, one, of those, one of those articles, I think, kind of suggested that the loser wasn't necessarily like some prisoner of war. It could be like local political rivals. Right. But, one of the articles was saying that like in some of the depictions, it like has the names of like noble, noble positions and stuff. Oh. Being like the defeated people defeated by the king or whatever, whatever the leader is called. Um so yeah, that was interesting because almost almost in, in that way, if it is something staged, it's like some form of capital punishment. Well, yeah. that could be it's a, a war reenactment. I, most people can't actually see a battle, right? Because the battles happen usually somewhere else right. and with the warriors. So if you do like a public war reenactment where you're actually, you know, redoing the the... The killing it's it's both a, a spectacle and uh you know public legitimacy statement also so, though what i first that. thought yeah. when david said this was about how one of the articles mentioned that there was a lot of gambling and stuff going on and like something about like documents and stuff like they were like deciding like governmental things like at these games uh, like if we win then you you vote for me like, yeah, so I don't know if that's how far, like, I, that was what I got from it, at least, kind of, this, I don't remember which article it was in now, um, but yeah, kind of, like, they were very much, I mean, like, and it reminds me of Roman gladiatorial games again, like, there was a lot of, like, elite culture things going on there that wasn't just about, like, watching people kill each other, um, right. So, the, I mean, just the chances that that kind of stuff wasn't happening. It definitely was happening, whether we, like, have it written down or not. If these ball games were something really prominent and popular and then, like, necessary on a ritual level, that means elite people were going to them and or partaking in them, and they were talking to each other at the and events. They didn't just sit there silently. <laughs> sponsoring them, right? Right, right. So... Yes, very interesting, just because it always comes back to how games, again, like we act like it's just something for fun and whatever, but like football in America, that's probably one of the biggest industries. That's a multi-billion dollar industry is just American football, let alone the 50,000 other sports that you can choose from. What about in more recent times? Is the game connected to anything? Do you know? I think now it's more of a reinscribed reinscribing of identity for a culture that you know same kind of thing like if 
modern Assyrian people who identify as Assyrian played the Meso- Mesopotamian ball game or something. I think that's but they don't. But yeah, they, yeah that, kind of, that, that kind of connection to and the modern Romans, modern Romans, if they yeah, modern Romans. But I mean, we have that kind of like reenactments of battles today. Are that are they not like yeah, yeah, Valley you know, Forge every year. I mean, yeah. I grew up outside Philly, so every year, yeah, reenact battle. The, and that's something that people else are happens real into. People are super into that. That's <laughs> also an end. Like people can spend thousands of dollars to get their uh, uniforms right and accurate. They sit out there and eat like what they would have eaten. Healthy. Right, exactly. I always love that's the people that play okay. on the losing side oh, and yeah. spend like thousands of dollars to go to reenactments and get all the right clothes and all and this stuff lose. to know <laughs> that they're on the losing side. <laughs> Or like, you know, in America, like the losing, like super racist side. <laughs> so like, fun. <laughs> I never, I never got that one either. But I, to be honest, that's a little bit better to me than people who went and actually watched the Civil War and had picnics. <laughs> um, <laughs> recreating it is a little more like honoring the memory. I don't know you didn't want to actually join the army so you can like play and pretend like you're in the army. I don't know. <laughs> um, yeah, but it's also, you know, uh, reenacting cultural memory. Making no, it real, right, exactly. real for people, right? right? Nobody here was ever in the civil war or in the revolutionary war, not even their grandparents and great grandparents. Right. Nobody does, who does world war one and two reenactments? It's just memorials. But that didn't happen here. Too close, too close. No, no, that didn't here? happen in America. I know. So where would we, you know what I mean? Like, Americans in particular, I guess, to me, are very focused on, like, those ones happen in America, so it feels like we need to, re- like, the blood shed here. Like, we are in the place where these people died. Because do they not in other kind? I don't know. I don't go, like, around yeah, to even, World War II even sites the ones, in the UK. Even the ones here, like, you don't see people reenacting battles at some random field like it's at the spot where it happened right exactly yeah right. i think there are memorials at different um battlefields in europe yeah actually and i know for sure they do stuff for like d-day and stuff like that yeah they do. i know people that have flown there to partake in these kinds of things that are like in the military in america they do pearl harbor stuff mm. yeah by the way, today is a uh, celebration of the Re- revolution in France. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. So Still we day. will have a big, big fire. Uh, I forgot the few uh, don't please. How can I? Uh, fireworks? Uh, uh, fireworks, yes, yes. Tonight is a big fireworks. But we don't have a uh, inac- uh, reenactment. Re- I, 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 I don't know how to pronounce re- uh, reenactment. Reenactment of the, yeah history but very interesting i didn't know that you can throw people out of windows so yeah <laughs> <laughs> you can watch you can watch les mis <laughs> maybe token <laughs> french things <laughs> oh my gosh you guys i i know i mentioned this in other groups but one of my best friends is french from paris so we're always talking about token yeah. french things that americans do they do it all the time like french so fries fun. Yes. <laughs> or I love when people when Americans say French phrases they like have a little fake French accent like it makes them sound smarter or something I don't know it's so funny <laughs> if we're thinking of scholarly perspective French is, is a prestige language with respect to America to a large degree I mean English to a large mm-hmm. degree so that's why oh. they're doing it that way Oh, yeah, very much so. But now that I have a friend that pointed it out to me, I notice it all the time, like in TV shows and stuff. People will just randomly be like, yeah, they're joie de vivre and stuff. And I'm like, why? Like, why do they even need to? <laughs> with the hair flip. <laughs> yes, okay. with the hair flip, you guys. Of course. Yeah. Um, okay, we you guys. Want- so as you know, John's group is right after your group. And um, I don't yeah. I know that Michael and stuff at least goes to it. So I don't want to keep him here too long. Um, but I, yeah, it, so We can it wrap up. I think next week is the last meeting of this group. It is. Are yeah. we going to do this again live next week also? We can. I'm fine with that. Did anybody join? What do you mean anybody? Do you know if anybody watched? watch or anything? 
not that many people watch. Maybe we'll try to advertise a little. Did you? Did, can you tell if people watched? I can tell what that people are. Very few people are watching. Three were on <laughs> Facebook and one on YouTube. That might be one of us if it's open on a screen. Somewhere. Well, that's, honestly, I thought it would be zero. So zero. I don't click. have it open anywhere, so it's not me watching it anywhere. Yeah, but it'll be. I, I bet it'll get plays. Um, you know, people will watch it going forward, certainly on our Facebook. And also, we didn't advertise um, it at all. And we didn't advertise it at all. Text. But I think it would actually be a good thing to advertise and see if that would get us any traction. Next uh, week, we're going to look at the text of this, and then we'll talk broadly just more about games and theory okay. and modern world and stuff. That would be really cool. Yeah. And we, and we can play Moncala live together <laughs> online. Yeah, I, like, I like talking about my favorite thing to talk about, which is people who actually attend religious services and stuff on virtual things like second life so we'll talk about that for sure oh my gosh yes (laughs) i'm here for it of course (laughs) okay you guys well thank you all very much for coming um and discussing this fun thing that we don't normally discuss about with sasa besides the fact that shane is our resident not classical (laughs) expert (laughs) (laughs) Um, oh, well, let's put a plug right here. Anybody out there who studies ancient Mesoamerica and like would want to get involved with Sasa, please reach out to us. <laughs> David Danzig at SaveAncientStudies.org. Yes, or ancient stuff, period, ancient particularly stuff. if it's not classics and the Near East. Yeah, yeah, reach out to us. It's definitely very mutually beneficial for your resume. <laughs> and we have fun. I love the reading groups too, also. You guys, they like try to convince me not to go to all the reading groups because I can't stop going to all of them. So <laughs> I think we better quit while we're ahead here. Okay. Well, thank you all. Soon, soon we're going to be selling, you know, Sasa face masks. So is that, I was just going to say, but what about the face mask? <laughs> Okay, you guys, thank you so much. See you in five seconds in John's group, too. People, yeah, I'll see some of you tomorrow morning and the rest of you next week. So, yes, uh, thank great. you. Thank uh, you. Bye, everybody. Thanks, John, Caroline, Ariel.